Good morning, and thanks for everybody for coming out. It is a real honor to be here uh, at Nexus. This is my first one. Ah, it is really terrific to, to be here. I love skeptic conferences. This is uh, sort of the kickoff of the season after this. There are so many science and skeptical and, and dork conferences coming up over the summer uh, with Comic-Con and Dragon-Con and all that too. So I'm really excited to be here and uh, overwhelmed to be the keynote speaker. Uh, especially uh, just given the state of skepticism today, how strong this movement is, is going. We're big enough to actually start having schisms, which is awesome. Uh, so, uh, after, and after last year's talk at TAM, I don't know if you, uh, if you heard about that, I decided to do something a little less controversial this time. So I'm gonna talk about why the Twilight series is the greatest literature of all time. Um, I don't think anybody, I was, thinking, I was thinking Star Wars versus Star Trek, but I didn't want to get any fist fights going with the uh, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe guys. Um, so I decided, uh, I've been thinking a lot lately about skepticism in general. Usually I give talks about science and astronomy, uh, but you all have heard these. I'm, I'm out of talks. Every time uh, you know, Randy or DJ says, you know, come to Tam and give a talk, and I think, eh, what am I going to talk about? We're out of stuff. Happily, there's always the next doomsday, if not May 21st, then you know, 2012 or Apophis or whatever is going to come next. But I've been thinking about skepticism and how we do it, what it means to be an active skeptic. And, and I've just been tossing around a lot of ideas. And so this, this talk I'm going to give is called The Final Epsilon. I tried to make that title as clear as possible. Um, it, 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 I'll explain that in a, in a couple of minutes. But it's not a sort of typical talk for me. It's not, here are the facts, here's what's going on, here's why this person making this claim is wrong. It's more of a rumination. It's more of my thoughts about skepticism. And so take that as it is. Take it as just a, uh, <coughs> mulling out loud. Not all of this is going to be right. Not all of it is going to be wrong, I hope. Uh, but it is more or less my opinion about a lot of stuff and my experience about a lot of stuff. And there are some thoughts in here, and un unfortunately, there was long enough that I had to actually type it out. So if you see me just you know, bending over and reading and you can't hear me very well, just let me know. Um, as skeptics, how can we be certain about something? And I mean that in the most literal sense. How can you know that some effect will follow some cause, that some idea is right and some other idea is wrong? Um, this idea of certainty versus doubt is something that is our bread and butter as skeptics. But I don't know how many people have actually sat down and really thought about it, just really thought about what that means. Um, I've been thinking about this for a while, and um, this isn't, like I said, a debunking of bunkery. This isn't something that's, that's necessarily a, a bunch of statement of facts. I'm feeling my way through a lot of these issues, and so a lot of these conclusions are tentative. And in, in fact, that's what this talk is about. Um, I know a lot of skeptics, including me, have not really sat down and thought about this idea of, of how we know what we know. And we accept certain things about reality, in many cases, because experts have told us that this is what's going on. Now, I don't know anything about quantum chromodynamics or population genetics. I have friends who do. I only know the names of these fields. I can pronounce quantum chromodynamics. That's all I really know about it. Um, but certainly, if some expert in this field tells me, this is how we know that this is what's going on, my inclination is to say, well, they know what they're talking about. They're probably right. They might be wrong. I'll hold back some amount of reserve, some amount of skepticism. But in general, you know, I might accept what, what they're saying is true. And you might consider me an expert on some topics in, in astronomy or whatever, and, and uh, you know, that's fine. I can tell you about the Apollo missions to the moon, and I will. Um, I can tell you that the asteroid Apophis is not going to hit us in 2029 or 2036, or that a supernova is not going to blow up and destroy the Earth, and I can even tell you how a supernova works. So you might say, yeah, sure, he's an expert on this kind of thing. Um, but the question is, how do you know that I'm right? If you read my blog, you know I make mistakes. I will make errors, and I have to correct them, sometimes embarrassingly, sometimes not. Mostly they're grammat grammatical errors, but I'll live with that. But how do I know that I'm right? You know, I studied this stuff, and I don't even know if what I'm saying is right. I might make a mistake, or the field itself might change. Something might change that, that makes what I'm saying wrong. Um, how can I be certain that we went to the moon? And this is an interesting question. 
those of you who were at TAM last year may, have, uh, may remember that a moon hoax believer was there and confronted Adam Savage on stage and he talked to me behind stage. Um, I get asked by a lot of people who have doubts about the veracity of the Apollo missions, mostly kids who weren't alive during that time. And they want to say, you know, prove that we went to the moon. Well, the thing is, we as skeptics have a trick. And it's not really a trick. It's actually a logical basis. It's how we deal with things. If you want to make a claim about something, then it's up to you to show that what you're saying is right. Now, in this case, the Apollo missions are a matter of historical fact. Okay? They happen. We have all the history of it. If you want to say they didn't happen, the burden of proof is not on me to show that they did. The burden of proof is on you to show that they didn't. And I want to be clear, this isn't really a trick. This is the right way to do it. The burden of proof is on them. Now, uh, when I talk to these deniers, these Apollo deniers, these hoax believers, whatever you want to call them, and happily these conversations are becoming more rare, um, I'm not really claiming that we went to the moon. I'm claiming that their claims are wrong, that the evidence that they're showing me that uh, we went to the moon are not correct. Um, now, now, mind you, these are two different things. Claiming that we went to the moon or showing that we didn't go, showing that we didn't go to the moon is wrong. Those are two different things. Um, the onus is on them to show that we didn't go. And every time, and I mean every time, I can prove to them that, uh, that their claims are wrong. Now, for example, they claim that shadows on the moon are, or excuse me, that uh, there are no stars in the sky. And there shouldn't be stars in the pictures of the moon. I won't go into details here. They claim that the shadows aren't parallel. You can see that Buzz Aldrin's shadow and the lunar lander leg aren't, aren't going in the same direction. But you shouldn't expect them to be. It's just perspective. Again, I won't go into details. But you don't expect that to happen. They make claims about radiation. They make claims about the thermal properties of, of sunlight. In a, in a, and they're wrong because they, they don't account for the fact that in a vacuum there's only conduction and not radiation. I could go on and on and on. And most of you have probably uh, heard, heard of uh, these claims before and you've heard me debunk them. That you shouldn't be able to see in the shadows of the moon, that sort of thing. And, and you can. It's, it, everything's fine. And what's really happened is that um, when I'm confronted with these claims, usually I've heard most of them. Uh, I haven't heard all of them, but if given a, a few minutes to do some research or to think about it, typically I can, I can find out why what they're saying is wrong. And it, it always boils down to the same few things. They've misinterpreted a picture, willfully or otherwise, uh, misunderstood some data, applied bad logic, begged the question, used non sequiturs. The non sequiturs is a big deal now. Now that all the direct evidence, you know, there shouldn't be stars in the sky, or there should be stars in the sky. No, there shouldn't. All of their direct claims are easily shown wrong. They have to come up with, well, this political climate was in a funny place in the 1960s. It's like, yeah, but what does that have to do with the Apollo landings? It has nothing to do with it. So non sequiturs are big with them now. And in the end, they are wrong every single time. And usually, under, under this sort of frustration, they lash out at me and say, well, prove we went. And, and here's the thing. I can't. I can't prove we went to the moon. I mean, how do you prove we did this? And you know, people always say, you can't, you, can't, uh, uh, you can't prove a negative, which I think is wrong, and I'll, I'll get to that. You can easily prove a negative. But sometimes it's hard to prove a positive, and sometimes it's impossible. I mean, I can say, we went to the moon because of this and that and the other thing. We, we have moon rocks, and they show signs of micrometeorite pitting and radiation uh, zaps and uh, uh, elemental isotopes that are non-terrestrial and all this kind of stuff. And they can say, well, they had the technology to make these rocks in an oven and all this kind of thing. The technology was secret. You know, you can always make these sorts of claims uh, that sort of circumvent reality, and I know that they're wrong. But I can't say they're wrong, because it's possible. For all I know, NASA did have some secret lab where they were cooking up moon rocks. I don't think so, but it's possible. Um, now, of course, um, I can show you a picture like this. Uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is a NASA mission that's been orbiting the moon for a couple of years now. And it's been taking pictures of the Apollo landing sites. On the, uh, on the left there is a picture of Apollo 11. You can see the lander there. It's that bright spot. You can see some of the setups of the equipment. Their, their boot prints. They've got these for all the Apollo missions that landed on the moon now. But of course, this is a NASA mission. And you can't trust NASA, because NASA's the one who faked it in the first place, right? Um, I remember watching a documentary where one of the Apollo deniers was saying, show me a Hubble picture of the Apollo 11 landing site and I'll believe you. And I thought, wow, that's a great claim, because first of all, Hubble doesn't have the resolution to see the Apollo landing sites. And second of all, you know, we brought back thousands of pictures from the moon that you don't believe. 
Why would you believe another NASA mission that shows, you know, that pixel there? Yeah, that was the Apollo 11 lander. I don't think that's going to that's do this guy, uh, any good. You know, I can say, and so you can ignore this, I can say that when I was six years old, I stood six miles away from uh, the Apollo 15 liftoff. I saw a Saturn V launch into space, carrying three men to the moon. But, you know, why should you believe me? I'm just, I could be making this up. And this can go on and on and on. Um, it, it's easy to cast doubt on something, and it's very, very hard to show that what actually happened, happened. All you can really do is attack the claims that it was wrong. Um, and you can, you know, there are a lot of claims about the moon. There are hundreds, maybe thousands. I, I'm still surprised that people can come up to me and say, what about this thing that I found? It's like, I don't know. But you know, what about these 500 other things I've already debunked? You know, at what point do you say no? Which I'll get to in a moment. Now, you can always talk about the fact that uh, there's this no black swan idea, if you've heard of this logical fallacy, where you say it, it came up because uh, people believe there were no black swans, and then one was eventually found. And so you could use it as kind of an excuse, but you, you gotta be careful when you're relying on something that's never been seen before. I can say I have never seen any evidence that, that even casts a little bit of doubt in my mind that the moon landings are real, or that the moon landings are faked, excuse me. All the evidence I've seen is bad, but that doesn't mean there's not evidence out there that I haven't seen yet. You just have to be careful about that because uh, it may never show up. And you can always sort of hold out hope that something like that will come up, come up. But the thing is that leaves us in a funny place. It leaves us in a place where they can cast all the doubt they want, I can show they're wrong, but I can't prove that we went. Now imagine, and I apologize for this, but imagine that you're listening to me having an argument with a moon hoax denier, or a moon hoax uh, debater. Uh, and I, I apologize for that image. In some point in the argument, you have to make a choice. Okay, if you are totally non-biased, if you're going to say, I'm going to listen to both sides of this argument, I'm going to hear what's going on, and I'll make my decision. At some point, you have to make that decision. And that is an interesting place for you to be in. Um, what will happen is the moon hoax believer will say something. There are no stars in the picture is typically the first one. And then I can say, there shouldn't be stars in the picture. And you may, they make their argument, you might say, that's interesting. You know, that, that might sway me, but then I'll come along and say, no, they're wrong, and here's why. And you go, oh, okay. And then the moon hoax person goes on to the next step. Oh, what about the radiation? Oh, what about this? And I'll say no because da 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 da. And then they go to their next argument, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and the twentieth, and the five hundred thousandth. And at some point, you know, they, they bring out the big guns first, and they get they get you know weaker and weaker as time goes on. They their arguments become less specific, more general, more vague, and they they cover less the uh, less. Uh, uh, they're, they're just not as, as, as swaying as the big arguments that may have an emotional impact. And every time I can show where their logic is flawed. And eventually you start to sense a pattern. And there may not be a line in the sand where you say, I'm done. You know, it may be on the 10th or the 20th question or something like that, but it's somewhere at some point. You have to make a decision and say, you know what, I think this person is wrong. Otherwise, you're going to be listening to them make these arguments until the sun turns into a red giant and thankfully ends the argument. Um, <laughs> and, and believe me, there have been times I've been wishing for asteroid impacts uh, uh, for just that reason. Um, I'm not saying when you make that decision. Uh, it might be after the, you know, you, you don't want to do that after the first time somebody's wrong because everybody's wrong. Like I said, I'm wrong a lot. Everybody's wrong. You don't want to just cut somebody off and say, you've made a mistake. I'm never going to listen to you ever again. But after they've made their 20th or 30th wrong thing and it, you start to sense that pattern, you can make that decision. And that's the heart of this matter. There is no cut and dried line. You can never be 100% absolutely positively sure that we went to the moon. There's always yet another argument to be made, even if it's smaller and less, uh, less persuasive. There may just be something we haven't found yet. And as a scientist, and as a, as a, as a you know, the true meaning of the word skeptic, to doubt, I have to leave that wiggle room in my head. This person might be right. I doubt it. If I had to assign a probability to their being right, it would be a very, 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 very small number. Um, but it would not be zero, it, just not very far from zero. Um, however, as a human being, as someone living my life, as someone thinking about this kind of stuff, um, I don't have to be that precise. I don't have to be uh, that lenient. I can round down. I can round down from very, very close to zero to zero, okay, and I can do that. If someone asks me if we went to the moon, I can say, 
Yes, they did. And I can be sure about that because they did go to the moon. Um, but I have to be careful. And this is the difference that, I'm, that I want to talk about between being an active skeptic, being a scientist, and actually having to say, well, you know, we're pretty sure, we're very certain, and use those kind of weasel words, uh, and, and actually living your life as a human being and, and being free to round down. So with that explanation, I, I, I figured you talking about the moon hoax, you're probably all familiar with it. That's a good place to start. Um, I want to go from there. Uh, to something I know you're all going to love uh, first thing on a Saturday morning, and that is a calculus lesson. Um, it's actually not that hard, and it, you don't have to worry too much about the math, except, except for the, the uh, I'm trying to make a point here, and I'll get to that point. So there's a thing called the, the, the limit theorem, which talks about a function, a continuous function, and it's just f of x. And all this limit theorem says is that if you have, if you let your x approach a number, f of x is going to approach another number. So if I have a function, I plug a number into it, I'm going to get a number out. And if I let my, my x get very close to a certain number, my function is going to spit out uh, a certain number. And as the, as the theorem goes, it says that for every epsilon, I love this, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that this final line. Um, if the absolute value of x minus a is between 0 and delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So what the hell does that mean, right? Well, good. I have a diagram here, and it, this, this hopefully, I know, it, but hopefully this will make it clear. If I, if I pick a function, I, just, I found this on the web, so it doesn't matter. It's a very simple function. f of x equals 3x plus 5. All that means is that if I plug in x, let's say I let x equal 2, 3 times 2 is 6, plus 5 is 11. So f of 2 equals 11. That's what you have to know. And if you look on the diagram, you see where, where a equals 2, l equals 11. So if I let x equal a, then f of x equals l. Now the thing is, if I let x be somewhat offset from a, let's say uh, subtract 0.2. So now I let it be 1.8. And I plug that into my equation, the answer I get is 10.4. If I let it equal something bigger than, than 2, 2.2, I plug it into f of x, I get 11.6. So what that's saying is that on the left, it, or on, on the right, if I let my x vary a little bit by some amount, call it delta, my f of x is going to vary by some amount called epsilon. And that that's always, that the absolute value of that's always going to be greater than zero. In other words, if I'm not precisely on x equals a, f of x is not going to be precisely on l. That's all that's saying. I can get closer and closer. I can let delta get teeny, teeny, tiny. And it won't exactly equal x equals a. It won't exactly equal 2. Well, then f of x isn't going to exactly equal l. I can get closer and closer and closer and never really reach it. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. This is important that f of x is continuous. It's not discrete. Um, and, I, and I say that because you can imagine that instead of it being a nice continuous line like this, imagine you're, you're climbing up a, step, a set of stairs. And you, you can only take these steps that are a certain amount every time. And when you're on the second to last step, the goal is to reach the top flight. You can take one more step and be there. You are now, ta-da, on the top floor. You've made it. With this, that's not really the case. You can always get closer to what value you want and never actually quite reach it. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's like saying, what's the biggest number? And you can come up with a, a big number, and then you can add one to it, and you get a bigger number. There is no bigger number. You, there is no biggest number. You can always get closer. Um, this reminds me, if this sounds familiar, it sounds like Zeno's paradox. There were actually several paradoxes done by Zeno, uh, the, the Greek thinker. And the one, that, the one that I always laughed at, it was the first one I heard of, is he had this idea that if I have a bow and arrow and I shoot it at a target, I shoot the arrow at a target, to get to the target, it first has to get halfway to the target. But to get halfway to the target, it has to get halfway to halfway to the target, right? It has to get a quarter of the way of the whole distance. But to get half of half, it has to get half of half of half, an eighth of the way to the distance. And you can keep doing that forever. There's always a smaller number it has to get to before it can get to the target. There's an infinite number of steps between bow and target, and therefore, the arrow can never actually reach the target. He argued that this meant that motion was impossible. I prefer to think that his math was wrong. Um, <laughs> But you may be seeing where I'm going with this. Um, his math wasn't wrong. It's just that he was using sort of the wrong assumptions and drawing the wrong conclusion. These are two different systems, a continuous system versus a discrete system, something that, something that allows infinite number of steps versus something where you can only take finite size steps at a time. And it's interesting, it also reminds me of this argument, which happens all the time, that, e that, that showing that uh, 0.9999999999 forever equals 1. 
And I see arguments about this all the time, and I think there are a lot of ways of proving this. 0.9999999 forever equals one, and this is one very simple way of showing that. It really does. Uh, you can argue this all you want, but you know, that, it, that it can't, that there's always gotta be some step between 0.9999 and one. And the answer is no, there isn't. They are in fact equal. And if this bugs you, that's fine. We did not evolve to understand infinitely small steps and continuous functions and infinite series. That's not you know, what we needed to do when we were throwing spears at saber-toothed tigers uh, 20,000 years ago or whatever. Um, but you know, math is math, it is what it is, and these are two different systems. Um, it doesn't matter whether you believe in this or not, it is still true. Um, it doesn't matter how much faith Zeno has in his assumptions. If I shoot an arrow at him, he better damn well duck. <laughs> so now I can put these two concepts together. This idea of leaving a little bit of wiggle room in a, in a concept, in an idea that we have, and the idea that you can still sort of asymptotically approach a solution and yet still reach it. We can distinguish between being literal skeptics from being human. And, and pardon me if, if I'm saying that skeptics aren't human. Uh, I'll let you draw your own conclusions there. But um, for literal skeptics and for scientists and that sort of thing, that delta never really reaches zero. We can't actually get to that final, final input value that we want where we have a solution. There's always some epsilon. There's always some little tiny bit of wiggle room we have to leave. And we never approach that final, well, we approach a final concrete answer, but we just can't make that last step. We have to leave the room in there that we might be wrong. In science, we accept an explanation as adequate if it does a good job of explaining. But there always has to be some room for improvement. Um, a good example of this is Newton's law of gravitation. Uh, he came up with this. He finally quantified uh, gravity, was able to put down some equations, and it worked great. You know, you can plot the course of the moon, you can have an apple hit your head, although Zeno, of course, would say it never hit his head. Um, and it worked for the phenomena with which Newton was familiar. But then Einstein came along and he said, listen, you know, at, at high velocities and, and large masses, things change. And he reformulated this and came up with his, his uh, his theories of, of relativity, um, and it turns out that it's better. Okay, Newton wasn't wrong. We use Newton's equations to plot spacecraft trajectories, and it works, it works great. There's no reason to worry about uh, moving near the speed of light if you're only moving at a few miles per second. Uh, it, it's usually good enough, um, but Ni Einstein came along and improved it, and in fact, uh, Einstein's formulation of Newton's laws reduces to Newton's laws at low velocity and low mass. You can actually show this. And what reality is is sort of emerging between Newton and Einstein. <laughs> and I have to say, uh, I had this idea for this slide and I put this together. I went online and found a site that morphs faces. And it really bugs me that if you take two of the greatest mathematical and scientific minds known to man and merge them, they kind of look a little bit like David Tennant, uh, <laughs> who played Doctor Who. I think, that's, uh, I think that's an interesting analogy. But um, the point is, New people like to say that Newton overthrew, or excuse me, that Einstein overthrew Newton. New Einstein proved Newton wrong, and that's incorrect. He didn't. He improved upon Newton's formulation. Newton's epsilon was bigger than Einstein's. You can think of it that way. You know, that sounds a little dirty. Um, <laughs> but it's true. Einstein's, Einstein's epsilon is smaller. He's a little bit closer to the solution we want. Now, we know there's still some epsilon left. I won't go into details, but we know that relativity does not talk very well, some aspects of relativity, that doesn't talk too well of quantum mechanics. We know quantum mechanics works because we've blown up atomic weapons, because we have electronics, because we have solar panels. Quantum mechanics works. Relativity works. Your GPS depends on relativity. It would be off by something like a kilometer a day if, if, if relativity didn't work. We know that these two aspects of understanding the universe both work, and yet there's some problem with them that they don't talk to each other well. Someday we may be able to unify these two things, but right now we can't. And that means that there is still some small epsilon. It may be very tiny, and it may be in quantum mechanics, it may be in relativity, it may be in both, but it exists. Um, that's great for science, but again, in real life, you can let an epsilon go to zero. It's okay. Newton's epsilon is greater than zero, but it's good enough to get our spacecraft to other planets. So we can assume it's zero as far as we're concerned. And you know, when you're, when you're putting pencil to paper or uh, finger to touchpad, I guess now, um, that's the way to go. You can assume that epsilon equals zero. And, and this is the same idea, uh, well, 
for this idea that I, uh, when I talk about the moon hoax, I have to leave some amount of wiggle room in there that it might have been faked uh, as a scientist. But really, that epsilon is incredibly small. I can say that we went to the moon. And this sort of idea is the same. It can be used in arguing about atheism and agnosticism, too. Now, um, I love this, uh, the, the bus campaign that came out a couple of years ago in London that said, there's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Um, I like this for many reasons. One is that it kind of follows my don't be a dick rule. Uh, not every advertising campaign has. Um, but also, I just love the line, there's probably no God. Um, it doesn't say there's no God. It says there's probably no God. I love that. That's great. That's leaving that epsilon in there. That's saying, hey, epsilon's greater than zero. We'll have to live with it. Um, unfortunately, the people you're arguing with may be able to run with that and say, why aren't you sure? Well, um, when you're talking about atheism and agnosticism, there are probably more definitions for these words than there are stars in the heavens. Um, but I think you know, we, can, we can be a little bit vaguer. When I'm, when I'm in the, at the bar at TAM or reading bulletin boards or just talking to people, an agnostic is someone who says there's probably no God. You know, I don't have evidence that there's no God. I have to leave a little bit of wiggle room in there, a little bit of doubt, but probably not. Whereas an atheist says, no, there's no God. Now, I'm not going to get into hard atheism, soft atheism, this and that, and, 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 and. I don't, I, don't worry about that. I'm not trying to get bogged down in details of these words. Just keep in mind the concept of having a little bit of room for doubt versus being certain when it comes to the existence of God. I know it's an oversimplification, but don't worry about it. Um, I think the analogy to the moon hoax here is obvious enough. If you're arguing for a particular form of God, whether it's a literal biblical God or a Muslim God or the Jewish God that I was taught when I was a kid, um, you, can, you can falsify this argument of the existence of God when it strays into provable claims. Uh, Noah's Ark or, or the Earth is 6,000 years old or anything like that. I can show you, no, these claims are incorrect. That doesn't disprove the existence of God. It just dis disproves sort of that particular interpretation of that God. Um, at some point, though, you know, you can keep making these arguments. You can keep saying, what about this? What about this in the Bible? What about this? And at some point, again, these arguments get smaller and smaller. And when the existence of God falls short, you have to have that discussion again. At what point do you say, we're done talking here? Is there a God or is there no God? Make your choice. And just like in the moon hoax argument, as a scientist, I have to leave some room for the idea that God may exist. And again, it may not be the Christian God, the Muslim God, or any one of the forgotten gods from any number of the forgotten civilizations that have been around for 20,000 years. That's not that important. Um, it, it doesn't matter. I just have to leave room for the idea that there might be a God. Now, technically, that makes me an agnostic. It may only be a teeny tiny bit, but my God epsilon is greater than zero. Now, I kind of like that phrase, my God epsilon is greater than zero. Um, now, I'm a guy. I live my life. I get up in the morning. I make my coffee. I get my daughter out the, out the door to go to school. I go down and I, I sit down in front of my computer. I may or may not be wearing pants. Um, <laughs> And I'm not thinking about God. I'm not worrying about that at that point in my life. I'm just living my life. And I'm living my life under the assumption that God doesn't exist. And I assume technically that makes me an atheist because I'm, not, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just living my life like God doesn't exist. In that case, my real life dilemmas, my God epsilon equals zero and it doesn't matter. Now, of course, that changes a little bit when living my life means standing up here in front of you guys and talking about God. Um, it, it, when you talk about, as a skeptic, when you're actually talking about God, you're thinking about God, and it becomes kind of like a quantum mechanics problem where you're influencing the, uh, the, uh, the outcome because you're actually thinking about it. Um, but here I'm just talking about the workaday lives of everyday people. I don't feel God guiding my hand when I'm cooking a burrito for lunch. And so uh, in, in, in that case, the existence of God or the lack thereof just doesn't matter. It's not important. Um, and come to think of it, if any god or gods supposed by religions do or do not exist, I doubt I'd live my life any differently. If you, if you were to prove that, that there was a god that created the universe and went away and, and doesn't promise heaven or hell if you live by some moral code, I don't think I'd change how my life works now anyway. So I, it's in, that's also another interesting philosophical uh, windy path, and I'm not going to get into that now. That might be something we could talk about later. 
Now, if you are a religious person, and a specifically uh, religious person, then perhaps you do spend time thinking about this in your workaday life. But here, what I'm talking about here are non-believers, or even mild believers. And I know plenty of deists. Uh, last year, after, after TAM, I talked to plenty of people who believe in a non-specific God, sort of an impersonal, you know, lowercase g God, if you want to think of it that way. And this idea of epsilon and living your life versus, versus leaving room in, uh, for doubting of God, they may have that as well. And, and if, if you're that kind of person, I would love to talk to you about this later. Uh, buy me a drink and we'll talk. Probably easier to talk about this after, after you've had a drink or two. Now, with Pascal's wager notwithstanding, you know, you're on your deathbed, it, it probably makes sense to, to, to pledge your allegiance to God uh, so that you make sure you get into heaven. But ignoring about that, we don't have to be sure about God to live our lives. Um, in that case, I think there's no real working difference between being an agnostic and being an atheist. The difference only comes in when you're actually trying to figure out the difference. And with most atheists and agnostics, I suspect, aren't outspoken about it. Now, present company accepted. I know there are going to be a lot of atheists in this, in this audience. I know there are at TAM. And, and we talk about this kind of stuff a lot. And we know that there are a lot of atheists out there, millions of them in America alone. And they probably just live their lives. They're not coming to TAM because the attendance isn't that large. Um, and, and there are 400 of you here, and, and there's, what, 5 million people in New York City. So we know there must be a lot of atheists out there who aren't living their lives thinking about this all the time. Um, they don't fret or worry about it, they just live their lives and don't worry about that final epsilon. But what about other skeptical targets? I mean, certainly, certainly religion is a big one. But it's interesting to me, I was, as I was thinking about this, not every topic deals, uh, can, can handle this epsilon idea that well. For example, homeopathy doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. We can prove it doesn't work. You're drinking water. The only thing homeopathy cures is thirst. <laughs> There's no wiggle room here. You can say, well, you know, a homeopath does this and does that and treats the patient like a human being, and, and therefore they have, there's this placebo effect, there's a psychological effect. It's like, I don't care about any of that. That would work with anything. You could be giving them water, you could be giving them anything. And it doesn't matter that it's, it's, this, it's this distillation of water that we're talking about here as a scientific process, as a claim that you guys are making, is wrong. We can prove that with controlled studies, double-blind studies. Homeopathy does not work. It's epsilon, boom, zero, does not work. A complimentary example is autism and vaccines. Um, uh, this is a, an avatar I actually use on my blog whenever I talk about, uh, talk about this, uh, this thing. And it's interesting, whenever I mention vaccines and autism, uh, the comments are fascinating that I get on the blog, if a little bit of head explodey inducing. Um, eventually, somebody always comes along and says, we don't know what causes autism. They want to say that vaccines cause autism, and I say, we know they don't. And they say, but we don't know what causes autism. And I say, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we don't know what causes it. We know what doesn't cause it. We know that business cards do not cause autism. We know that neutrinos do not cause autism, right? We know that, that Comic Sans font doesn't cause autism. I, I apologize for using Comic Sans before. I was hoping that might alleviate the calculus problem a little bit. Um, just because we don't know what causes autism doesn't mean we don't know what doesn't cause autism. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know what I mean, okay? We have solid statistical evidence. There's, there's the Danish study, all these studies, you can find them online. Huge groups of people, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. There is no increase in autism in the vaccinated groups versus the unvaccinated groups. We know that the anti-vaxxers are wrong. Their epsilon is zero. Um, and, it, you know, for homeopathy, for, for, for the, the anti-vax crowd, for a lot of these things, we know their epsilon is zero, well and truly. We have proof that they are wrong. And so it's not the kind of claim where there's still some sort of nebulous thing going on where you can continue to make smaller and smaller claims. They've made, they've made their stand, they've been shown wrong, epsilon zero, boom, we're done. Now, people can still believe what they want, okay? Zeno is not required by law to duck. Um, it's his choice. But he has to pay the consequences. And in some of these cases, like homeopathy, and certainly in vaccinations, um, the, the public is who pays that price. And we're seeing an increase in measles and pertussis and that sort of thing. So we have to keep arguing about this. Um, boom. I don't want you staring at her. Sorry about that. It's uh, Jenny McCarthy with a syringe through her head is very distracting. Um, in the realm of science and in doing research, scientists have to let epsilon be greater than zero. No matter how small, we have to leave room for doubt because you don't know if evidence is going to come along, which disproves your theory. And the, you know, the, 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 the pseudoscience crowd loves to say, you used to think the 
earth was flat. And it's like, well, everybody thought the earth was flat. It, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that Columbus proved it round or anything like that. Um, it, it's just that uh, science evolves. And it's, you know, yeah, sure, okay. We used to think the earth was the center of the universe. Now we understand there is no center of the universe. Science has learned. This is not a weakness of science. This is not a weakness of skepticism. Being certain about something is weak, right? The, the, the stronger the tree is, the more likely it is to break in a strong wind. That's an old, old analogy. Um, but this is, this is probably science and skepticism's greatest strength. Relativity might be the most well-tested theory of all time. Brian Cox, the, the British physicist, has pointed out that it's tested millions of times a day in, in uh, uh, particle colliders all the time. If relativity didn't work, we would not be seeing the results we do in particle colliders. Um, we know it works, but it has to be incomplete. We know it is incomplete to be square with quantum mechanics. But when arguing with the anti-science people, when people who say, I've got this new theory that proves relativity is wrong, um, I don't think we need to be that precise. I don't, need to be, I don't need to have to argue that we don't know everything about relativity. We don't have to mince our words. We don't have to say, well, maybe, or we think, or, or this sort of thing. After all, as we know, the supporters of anti-reality and the media both jump on any uncertainty, no matter how small, and you know, aha, you don't know for sure. And they inflate it as if it's the most critical thing that we're saying, when it really isn't. It's this really tiny thing. And it wiggles off into, into some sort of tangent, and, and you're lost after that. And so, look, um, when I'm interviewed about these sort of things, I am perfectly happy to say that vaccines do not cause autism. I'm happy to say we went to the moon and that homeopathy doesn't work, that relativity works, that quantum mechanics is right. I don't have to worry about that. I may be a scientist and a skeptic, but I'm also a human being. And I can come to the point where I can jump and go to that final epsilon. Thank you very much. Oh.